Some of you may be aware of Dr. Wheeler. He shows up to one or two working group calls a day. <laughs> no, I, th I think David is on pretty much, uh, tries to make the rounds of every working group very busy in trying to help us in open source security uh, and also a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, education. David Wheeler is the Director of Supply Chain Security for the Linux Foundation and is also a passionate educator. He's written several books and papers on security and he lectures on developing secure software at George Mason University. David helped lead the development of the CII Best Practices Badge, which is now branded the Openness, Openness is if. Best Practices Badge. That's right. Yeah. And that is, he has helped numerous open source projects operate more securely. Uh, he's the author of Developing Secure Software Training Course, which is available through edX or uh, the LF Training for free. It is my pleasure to turn the stage over to my friend, Mr. Wheeler. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. You're going to talk about an awesome, amazing topic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, I hope. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so uh, technically, I am a doctor, but my experience has been whenever when someone calls me Dr. Wheeler, that means I'm getting set up. And clearly, it's no different today. <laughs> okay. I actually think I'm, we're starting slightly early. Is that okay? We're about five minutes ahead. Are we okay with that? I'm getting the thumbs up. Okay, so for those who didn't come early, they're going to miss out. Well, at least I'm going to, I'm going to hopefully uh, provide some information that they wanted to see. Um, all right, so as uh, Crow mentioned, I'm David A. Wheeler. I'm going to talk about education and training, and hopefully this will be more than just education good, ignorance bad, although I actually believe that that's true. Uh, but we want to delve in because education, I think most of us will agree, is pretty, pretty important. But let me drill down a little bit further. If you read the abstract for this talk, here's what I said I was gonna, I'm going to do, and hopefully I'll, I'll be able to do that. I'm going to try to claim that many software developers are receiving inadequate education and training on how to develop and distribute secure software. I'm really thinking the whole mix, you know, development, building, distribution, operations, and so on. I'm going to discuss both why it's a problem and some steps that we're taking to correct that. Uh, but I can't say that we've got everything all done or even all the steps all completely laid out. Uh, what you're seeing is the bridge being built. So first, I want to try to argue and convince you that we have a more generally a serious cybersecurity skill and education gap, and that includes the knowledge about how to develop secure software within the development world. And you know, I'm a big believer in trying to get actual data where you can. Um, so here's some interesting uh, data points I think uh, kind of justify the claim. So CSO Online 2016 said that 46% of organizations said they had a problematic shortage of cybersecurity skills. Five years later, you can see it's going in the direct direction. Now 57% of organizations are having a problem. Great. Okay, now granted the, tech, the questions weren't worded exactly identical, but I, I, think, I, I don't think the overall impression is wrong. I think what you're seeing right now is there's already a skills gap and we have more demand. When you have more demand and not enough supply, the results are not good if you're the one trying to get the supply. Um, what data economy claims 4 million unfulfilled, un unfilled cybersecurity positions. I mean, you, there's a lot of quibbles you can say about this kind of data, but I, I think other people have looked, have agreed. You know, you can quibble about how you measure it, but there's clearly a gap. Um, Poneman basically has a report in 2020 uh, that 53% of developing organizations don't ensure that they have development on, training on what they call secure coding. By the way, it may seem strange, but I actually don't, I'm going to use the phrase secure coding in several places because that's what my sources use, but I'm actually not a fan of that phrase. Uh, coding is a very narrow part of software development, okay? And when you're doing software development, it's not just typing in text into a screen, okay? There's a whole lot more that goes on. You have to figure out what to do, okay? Um, but that's okay. This is what my sources are using. Uh, 2019, there's no top 40 U.S., what they call coding, or top five non-U.S. Computer, uh, computer science school uh, requiring secure coding. Now, hey, in 2022, we had a slight improvement. Looking at only the top 24, we now have one. You may know who it is. I'm sorry? 
Name names. Okay, it's UC San Diego. So good for you, UC San Diego. Shame on you for everybody else. <laughs> Shame on you. And, and this, this report in the bottom here, I mean, there, you can see the report, uh, but you know, the, the, the interesting tag, poll that I've, uh, phrase I pulled out is, universities don't train computer science students in security. And isn't that wrong? I think it's terribly wrong. I have an engineering degree, and they didn't let me out with some other things you might not think of as engineering, things like ethics and economy, you know, things that, well, that didn't involve designing circuits. Yeah, but you still need to know that. And I think security nowadays is a critical part of knowing how about uh, software development. All right, uh, LF did a survey. And what we found was that uh, when people were queried, they were asked, hey, which of these things would be helpful for improving open source software security? And now we're narrowing much more specifically on open source software and security. Okay? And people were allowed to answer with multiple answers. So you, this is not, you're not going to see a total of 100%. Uh, the top three, well, the first one was best practices. I'm sure Krobe is very unhappy to hear that. Uh, number two was tools, okay? But number three, uh, in, in terms of agreement, was more training in secure and memory safe programming for the open source software community. So there's clearly a widespread view that training would be really, really helpful. Okay, and you can look at some of these numbers and, and so, but you know, you, you, there's widespread agreement. Now, when I went out and looked and, hey, what are the what's the data and the statistics telling me? There was one study that at first seemed to contradict this. But in fact, I think what it's telling is a story of, of efforts trying but not succeeding to deal with the problem. Okay? If you go, uh, and this is 2022, so this year, um, Secure Code Warrior survey reports that 89% of their survey takers say that they've received sufficient training in secure coding skills. 89%? That is completely different from what everyone else is saying. Now, whenever you do a survey, it's always possible that the respondent's set is very different from everybody else's set. Okay, and that's, that's a notorious, it's always a challenge whenever you're doing research, okay? And that is, of course, possible for this. But I'm going for the moment just to accept it at face value because in, indeed that's a problem for all surveys. So what does this say? 89% sounds like we're done. Well, wait a minute. Mission accomplished. Yeah, let's stand in front of that aircraft carrier. All right, when you look at that next sub bullet, let's look at what they mean. They say we've had sufficient training but most of them are not familiar with the common vulnerabilities. They don't know how to avoid them, and they don't know how they can be exploited. Why do you think that's sufficient? <laughs> In what world would that be sufficient? If I was a bridge builder, and I didn't know the common ways that bridge building fell, fell down, the one thing I know is you should not be hiring me to build a bridge. <laughs> okay? If you, don't know what you're do if you don't know how to do the thing that you're being trained to do, there's a problem, right? Right. Okay, it's more than this. I mean, 92%, they need more training on security frameworks. Wait a minute, you said thought, you know, and granted, maybe this is just a very narrow understanding of coding. But guess what? Software development is much more than typing text or drawing arrows, okay? 81% um, they said they do regularly apply what they did learn. Now, that's impressive because it means that whatever they're getting they're at least finding useful. So the whole idea of, hey, no one will use this stuff, that's obviously not the case, okay? 86% um, said that it was challenging to practice secure, what they called secure coding. I'm going, why? Why is that hard? You know, buffer overflows. You know, don't, go, don't write past the buffer. Don't read past the buffer. Um, uh, SQL injection. There's prepared statements and other kinds of things you can use. They're not hard, okay? If you're having that much trouble, you didn't under, maybe you got a course, but you didn't learn what you needed to know. Um, now, it's not true that managers don't care. Nowadays, managers are saying they're a lot more likely to hire people with these kinds of skills. So what does this mean? As you can see from my slide, I think that when they say, hey, I'm getting sufficient training, it's not because it's sufficient, it's because they have ridiculously low expectations, okay? I think what's happening 
Now, I can't, from just the survey, figure out what's happening, okay? I can simply look at the data and the other data sets and try to figure out what's happening. But I have a story that I think, I have, I'll call this hypothesis, that I think explains it. For the most part, our schools are not teaching the fundamentals that they need to know, okay? They're, they're edu our educational systems are failing at education. So what are our organiz what are the what is industry doing? They're trying to quickly ramp up their developers by giving them some quick little courses, you know, maybe an hour or so, maybe a nice cute video. And they're finding even that small snippet helpful. They are using it, but it's not enough. They don't know what the common vulnerabilities are, for example. And so uh, Mary Simpkins has this wonderful phrase. I'm going to steal it, and I mean I give her, give her credit too. Uh, whether she wants it or not. Uh, but edutainment is not education, okay? It's okay, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, me, I'm not against e e entertainment, not at all. The more interesting we can make our educational and training resources, the better, but that should be the secondary for purpose. The first is aiding learning. Uh, they did say that one of the top ways to improve secure coding training was get a certificate. Basically, they'd like to give credit. Now, again, this is what this suggests to me is that a lot of organizations are trying to create little in-house programs, but with very short resources. So you know, making short little resources or hiring out for a very short course, um, and frankly, what they're getting isn't what they fully need. Um, how do they prefer to get this? They want codes. They want to see code samples. They want to see annotations. They want it self-paced. Okay, um, articles, books, okay, multimedia if you can, uh, but they, you know, they, that's the kind of thing they're looking for, okay? And so I, this is the, huh, this wasn't what, you know, all the other data says X, this seems to say not X, and I think what this gives us is a more nuanced understanding. There is a problem, people are trying to fix it within their organizations, but it's not working um, yet. But there is some hope because even these, what frankly seem to be pretty terrible uh, courses, they're still finding useful. So let's do better, okay? But, but you could say, and although I don't, most people don't really fight that hard about education, there are some folks who have kind of questioned it, and that's and it's fair, you know, question your, your assumptions. Um, aren't there alternatives? Because educating developers, that takes time, that's work. Can't we do some other things? Well, I mean, some, we've definitely tried other things. Uh, certain large organizations, uh, who will remain nameless, um, you, know, you can probably guess them, uh, have, have tried the, we're just gonna take some insecure software and configure it, you know, we'll turn the knobs and run some stigs and we're gonna suddenly make this insecure software secure. And what they found out is that you can't do knob twiddling to turn insecure software into secure software. Okay. Yes, you can turn on some more secure configurations. Yes, you can disable some very insecure protocols. But in the end, the software has to actually be designed to be secure. You can't just twiddle some knobs to make it secure. What about training the end users? Well, here's a problem. End users actually have work to do, and it isn't babysitting insecure software. <laughs> okay? Um, I'm not against education in general. Um, and you know, sure, there are cases where you can at least try, but frankly, you're never gonna get a lot of satisfaction of trying to train everybody who uses a computer, okay? That's just, that's too large, the ocean is too big, okay? Uh, and frankly, user training, for the most part, is pretty ineffective. If you look at the cl uh, click-through after you've had, you know, I've trained on, you know, don't click on that link in an email, oh, you don't think they'll do it tomorrow? You know they will. And they'll do it, and you know what? Here's the dirty secret. If you can't click on a link from an email, you design some software badly. That's what links are for, <laughs> okay? They're to click on them, that's what they're for. So if you can't do that safely, then the software is wrong, not the user. All right, why not use tools? Now here, we are getting some, actually a fairly good retort, okay? Because I actually do believe tools are absolutely necessary but they're not sufficient, okay? False positives are require human judgment, okay? Almost every tool is gonna to report things that are an issue from the point of view of the tool but are not really security issues. Conversely, pretty much all, all tools are going to miss some things, okay? And this means 
we have to have human judgment, which means we need to have users who can understand what the tools are saying or not saying. Okay? Uh, there's an old phrase, a fool with a tool is still a fool. Um, I, years back, I, one of the two things that I've done, uh, I, I implemented years ago, uh, is a little static analysis tool. Somebody scans uh, a program looking for vulnerabilities. It found some vulnerabilities, but don't worry, they inserted some comments above each line to disable the report. That fixed the vulnerabilities. No, it did not. <laughs> there are two CVEs with the name of my tool in there because it found the vulnerabilities and they didn't know what the, what the tool was telling them. And then it's not that the tool's hard to use, it's that you have to, the tool on the other end of the eyeballs needs to be ready. All right, um, so why not just use secure by default APIs? Now here, we are in total agreement. We should, as much as possible, make things secure by default, both for end users and for developers. But the problem here is, who do you think makes these APIs? They do not fall from the heavens. Some developer had to figure out the APIs. And if a developer has to figure out an API, they have to know what security is so they can make an API that's secure by default. So we're back to, you know, it's not that this is wrong, but it's insufficient. We need education and really, yes, we do need tools. We need secure by default APIs, but we also need education in order for those other aspects to work effectively. They work together, not in opposition. And really, I would also say prepare for the future. Attackers are intelligent, adversaries. If you block off one path, they're going to look for another. And so we need to have intelligent defenders to deal with, it, with intelligent adversaries. All right, so with that, uh, as you probably know, one of the first things the OpenSSF did was uh, release a uh, course on how to develop secure software. You can blame me, I'm the primary author of it. Uh, but with lots and lots of help and review, I thank every single one of you. Um, it's basically approximately, I think, 16 hours to go through, and that includes clicking on some other links. Um, and it covers, it, you can break into three areas, requirements design and reuse, implementation, and then verification and other specialized topics. And the idea is that it's supposed to teach the fundamentals of developing secure software. And it's not specific to open source software. It turns out open source software is software, okay? So the necessary issues in developing secure software are true for all software. So it covers things like design principles. There are basic principles that are many decades old now from Salter and Schroeder. They're still true. They're going to be true next 10 years, next 20 years, next 30 years too. So we should, we, developers should know them. Um, using accept lists, not deny lists. You should know what the most common, common kinds of vulnerabilities are and how to prevent them from happening. Okay, does, you know, if, you, if, you're go, if your software is going to have vulnerabilities, at least make it a whole new kind no one's ever seen before. <laughs> Okay? The vast, vast, vast majority, you'll see different numbers, but you know, anywhere from 90% to 95% are the same old things. There's reasons why they're the same old things. Once you're aware of them, it's not hard at all to prevent them. Uh, the course is built for many uh, small modules, and in fact, the text is available under CC BY, so you can go and use it in all sorts of ways. And if you are interested in uh, get, uh, taking the course, there's a link right there. Okay, now initially it was available on edX uh, 2020. Um, now there the course is free, but there is a time limit. And if you want to get a uh, certification of completion, that does cost money. This is basically how edX works and that's fine. Uh, but a lot of people are saying that, hey, we're concerned, you know, if that, those costs of certifications are potentially a blocker, we want to encourage people to sh be able to prove that they took the course. So um, uh, on March this year, we made the material also available on the LF training and certification uh, platform. Okay, it has a slightly different name, but it's exactly the same material. Um, and here now, now on, on this platform, the course is free, but with no time limit and the certifications themselves are also free. And, you know, and once you complete it, it's, it's good for two years. Uh, we're gonna continue to make it available also on edX because a lot of people like the edX platform. Many organizations have special agreements with edX. We want this information to get out to all sorts of folks. So we're gonna, we plan to support both platforms. And I have a cool new announcement. 
Ooh, okay, so some of you already know about this, <laughs> okay. But, um, all right, so as of today, I want to announce that we're going to add an yet another way people can get access to this course material. Uh, it's something called SCORM Connect. Those of you who are really into the learning systems will already know what that is. Um, so it turns out that a lot of educational institutions, think universities, colleges, and so on, and a lot of large organizations have their own systems, what they call learning management systems. There's a lot of these in the market. Uh, and they basically um, enable you to track your employees or your students in terms of what courses they take, make sure they get certain things, and, you know, and, and, and track and so on. So uh, we're ma now making what the uh, Developing Secure Software course uh, in, um, available via SCORM Connect so it can be directly incorporated into those learning management systems. So if you're in a large organization or a university, you can just click on it through their system. It looks like it's embedded as part of theirs, but in fact, it's the material that we've already developed. Um, this is going to be, this is uh, free for OpenSSF Premier members. If you're not an OpenSSF Premier member, but a member, you can talk to us later. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it'll also, we're also going to make it free to accredited educational institutions uh, because we want to get this out. Uh, other organizations uh, can absolutely include it. We do, we would love for lots of folks to incorporate. We're trying to get this information out in as many different forms and ways as we can. Uh, it is going to be an annual fee for other organizations because it actually turns out to be costing a non-trivial amount for this sort of stuff. So but this, this, is, this is as far as I could get people to swallow <laughs> paying, uh, uh, paying our, 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 our costs. But uh, that said, we you know, don't feel like if you don't fit those categories, you can't do this. Absolutely. Come talk to us. Okay. Um, again. This provides another mechanism so developers can learn about this. It enables any integration. The course is going to continue to be free via LF's uh, training certification and the edX platforms. So if you're an individual or small business, you don't have one of these systems, don't worry about it. Just take it one, you know, through the mechanisms we already have. We're not removing anything. We're adding something. Okay. Um, quick quick uh, technical explanation for those of you who are really into this. Um, in the educational world, SCORM is a common format for training materials. Uh, it's been around for a long time. It's, we, if you want to put the learning materials, quizzes, everything else in that kind of form. Uh, SCORM Connect is a weird form of the SCORM file. It's a standard format and it omits all the content. Now, how does that work? Well, what it has is it has a little redirect that says, hey, to get the content, go over here to this website. Okay? Now, why do that? Because that way we can update the material, and instead of trying to convince people to update their material, we can rapidly update material as new information or as fixes uh, become uh, available. Okay. So, all right. Those are no. That's not by only means the only educational resource. Okay. OWASP has the security knowledge framework. Um, uh, the OpenSSF has actually provided some funding to that group. Um, and uh, this, uh, SKF is a different approach, although they actually embed the course within their materials, uh, the other course I just mentioned. Uh, but the, what's interesting about them is they do uh, hands-on code experience. The pro, of course, is when you do hands-on, you learn better. The, the con is that that takes a lot longer. So, you know, there's pros and cons to all sorts of approaches. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's a, a, a pro uh, if, you're, if you're willing to put in the extra time. Uh, Safe Code is some very nice training materials. There's various expensive materials. Um, I should note, uh, related, uh, that uh, the LF plans to soon release other courses on SigStore and DevSecOps. I can't say more yet, <laughs> but it's, it's coming, it's coming. Okay. Now, earlier Brian mentioned the various stream, the 10 streams in the mobilization plan, stream one was specifically about development education and certification, okay? So uh, what I just talked about, the course is a, is a part, a, a support for that broader goal. Um, and here's, if you look at the stream, uh, here's some of the things that it mentions. Basically, uh, relatively few software developers get serious formal training. You know, that survey notwithstanding, I, I, I think those don't count for many cases. If you don't know what the common vulnerabilities are, you got a problem. Um, you know, a small amount and ideally more. Uh, and there are some modules, train, train modules available free, like uh, ours and the OWASP one. 
and basically we want to make things better. So there's three parts to it. The first part is collecting and curating content. Let's get what's already available, okay, and make it easy to find, easy to use, work it together. We very much tend to intend to build on the, um, the course I just mentioned, uh, the Secure Software Development Fundamentals courses, uh, but absolutely add and, and do gap analysis. Second part is to expand training, okay, um, where we want to deliver training across industry. Uh, we want to partner. Okay? We are not everywhere. Nobody's everywhere. So we want to partner with everybody, lots of different kinds of organizations to get the, uh, the word out. Um, have unified certification approaches because if, if, there's, if everybody understands what something is, it's a lot more likely people will want to get those kinds of certifications. And finally, reward, incentivize developers. Um, working with major hubs for open source software development, GitHub, GitLab, and so on. Um, try to offer some uh, financial incentives, working with job boards. Well, it would be very cool. We don't have this yet, but I think it would be very cool if, for example, um, you went to Indeed or LinkedIn and you could say, oh, that developer has that certificate. Okay, or you went to GitLab and GitHub and looked on their on their page and oh look they they know how to do this. Um, I, I think you know uh, I, I think that would be awesome to be able to, to start to see that um, you know and creating the tier, some sort of tiered badging system with escalating rewards of some kind. Uh, when we first publicly released the mobilization plan, uh, we intentionally had breakouts to discuss each of the streams to get feedback, thank you, um, on those. And you know, the, one, of the, one of the ones that uh, we had was uh, a uh, discussion about stream one. Uh, lots of great comments. Um, one that particularly struck me, I'm not sure how to deal with it, but I find it very intriguing, was really a push to say, hey, wait a minute, most software developers learn a lot of how to develop software before they even hit college or universities, if they go do them at all. And I, there are various numbers, but a vast, it, it, you know, a vast number, somewhere around half of software developers don't go to universities, new colleges, at least for learning how to develop secure software. It may uh, develop software, it may even be much larger, but you know, it's a significantly large number. And whether it's a majority or minority doesn't matter, there's a lot of folks you won't hit if you only hit, say, the computer science and software engineering and those kinds of, of uh, uh, degrees. So push the education back to K through 12, and really especially at the high school level, um, and trade schools. Um, covering univer universities and code boot camps and existing practitioners, increasing the demand for these courses. Uh, maybe we can find ways for governments to incentivize this. Okay, and um, in fact, I mentioned some of you earlier, you know, translations for international consumption. Um, you know, uh, you know I, I learned a little French, and the main thing I learned is that nobody wants to hear my attempts at French. So, okay, uh, so, <clears throat> so we, we really want to make this international, and, that, and part of that's going to need to be figuring out how to get uh, translations. So, if you are interested in improving the world of having software developers educated and trained in how to actually write secure software, what do you do? Well, hey, if you develop software, there's an easy one. Take a course, at least one, okay? You know, software development is a, is a as long as you're gonna do software development, it's a lifelong commitment to learning. That's not necessarily a bad thing. But if you're gonna develop software, you need to learn how to develop secure software. You know, go to that link, take the course. You wanna do the OS SKF, that's great. There's others too. Um, obviously, I, I developed one of the courses, so I like my course. But you know what? I'm way more concerned about taking a course. I don't care if you take that particular one. Um, I'm much more concerned, do you know what you need to know? Work with and oversee, if you work with and oversee those developing software, encourage them to learn, okay? If you manage other software developers, you, you probably already know that this is an issue. Well, you know, yes, it's a pain to stop for the moment and learn something, but it pays dividends over and over and over again. Improve existing training materials, okay? So for example, if you want to improve the course I just talked about, it's on GitHub, okay? It's CC BY. Uh, file an issue or even better, a pull request. 
Okay? And in fact, uh, one thing, interesting thing um, we've actually been talking about for several months uh, about how to make some interesting little uh, pictures to jazz it up and maybe help explain better. Um, so I just got permission uh, this morning from OpenAI to uh, use Dolly to uh, create some graphical images that we hope will clarify some of the concepts that are taught in the course. Will it work? I don't know, but we're going to do an experiment and find out. And I think that's really key, is let's look for ways to try to make things better, repeat. If the experiment doesn't work out, okay, you learn something, but if it does work out, you've made an improvement, and if you do enough of those, the results are gonna be better for everyone. If your organization has a learning management system, consider adding the OpenSSF course, okay? Um, you don't have to be a credit university or an OpenSSF Premier member, but if you are, then you, hey, it's free, and if you're not, come talk to us anyway, okay? Because uh, we, would, we would like to see more and more developers know, understand this material, uh, this kind of material. And finally, uh, OpenSSF Best Practices Working Group is creating within it an education SIG. Um, and the idea is to convert these higher level ideas into a plan, and more importantly, implement the plan. Um, there are way too many people who think that planning, is, do you do, create the plan and then you're done? Please, no, <laughs> okay? Uh, in fact, whatever you end up with is probably going to be different than your plan, and that's all right. Um, we, we need to implement. And join us, and if you're interested in the OpenSSF Best Practices Working Group, there's the link. So, education is a key part of improving tomorrow's security, and here's some of the ways we're trying to get there. So, with that, thank you very much. Do we have time for one question or? All right, one question. I, I, I may give you an I don't know, by the way. <laughs> yes. Um, is there training for managers and leaders as well as developers who are working in security? I, there probably is. This course wasn't particularly designed for, although it, it does depend on the kind of management you're doing. Um, there's a whole lot of managers who also write code, and in, for, the, for those folks, I think the, the course on developing secure software is, is still absolutely apropos. Um, that course really does assume that you know how to develop an A programming language, though. So there, I imagine that there's such courses, but I don't know of them offhand. Crow? There's also opportunity, since we have both the working group and this new SIG, if someone's interested in collaborating on making that material, that's absolutely a work stream we could help uh, facilitate. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. I would say step one is let's go find out research. And if it doesn't, that does sound like something that should exist. Four minutes? Okay. I, I, I hate to, to take away all the time, but uh, uh, the, the, the extra time we got. So... Uh, oh, wait, I see a, a hand in the back, I think. <laughs> My eyesight's terrible. So your training uh, suggests the use of uh, S-forms as part of the software development by, by Google. Ah, does the training suggest the use of S-bombs? Yes! <laughs> All right, so that, that was easy. Uh, yeah, it talks about S-bombs and not just, and more importantly, what they are and why. I will, I will quickly, yes, I, I see um, Mr. Freeman. <laughs> I see Alan's very happy about that. I will quickly note, though, that just having an S-bomb does not suddenly make things secure, and I'm, I'm sure you'd agree with that, too. Um, you, you, you've got to actually use, you know, S, an S-bomb simply gives you a list of materials. When you receive it, you're going to have to do something with that information, like look at it and, you know, run a tool and say, hey, are there known vulnerabilities? Do I, should I worry about those? And you know, are, are some of these components hideously old? Does this suggest higher risk? So S-bombs don't tell you the risks. They give you the information necessary to help you identify potential risks. Risk. Yes, sir. Just a quick one out there. SB and S-bomb does not stand for silver bullet. Actually, let me repeat that for those of you. SB does not stand for silver bullet. Totally agree, yes. Yeah, uh, we currently, the, the challenge, 
More generally, it's very, very difficult to capture metrics. People don't want to report a lot of things. So we don't have like, you know, before and after analysis, that kind of thing. Um, it wouldn't be a bad idea, um, but I, I'll be honest, right now, this, the state of education is so woefully bad that, or, or actually, basically non-existent for most developers, or at least, it, you know, it's on the level of, I took a course, but I don't know what the common problems are, and I don't know how to deal with them. So, g given that, I don't think right now we're very worried about it. We, it. The state is so bad that anything is going to be an improvement, and so we haven't focused on that. But I do think as we as we go on forward, it would be great to try to measure, you know, you know, A/B testing. You know, we do it this way, do it that way, which is more effective. But we haven't made any plans for that yet. Uh, okay. I think we're. You know, I want to try to exit off so somebody can do the sync with their thing. So. Thank you. Thank you very yeah, much. Everyone, David Wheeler. <laughs>